Hi there, Coach Daniel here. Hope you're doing really well. And welcome to open class number four. <laughs> Hope this episode will bring a lot of value to you. As always, nothing here is medical advice, just general thoughts and comments that I hope will help anyone that's tuning in. Um, the person writing us a question and anybody else, of course, as well. So with that said, I felt I had an announcement today, but I can't think of it. So let us jump right into our questions that I've prepared right here. We have, in fact, uh, I think uh, six or seven questions to go over, mostly emails and some comments as well. Let's start here at the top. This is from Elena, um, a very, um, very, very big, big supporter. Thanks, Melina, for all, for all the encouragement and help. Uh, let's read this. Melina. Uh, says, hi, Daniel. So I have a question. I had to switch up my wake time from 9 a.m. to 7 a.m. So when I was waking up at 9 a.m., I allowed eight hours in bed. I'm trying to do the same for my new wake up time, 7 a.m. However, when 11 p.m. comes by, I'm tired but not sleepy. I still wake up at 7 a.m., but I'm very sleepy most of the day. Then when it comes close to bedtime, I'm not sleepy by 11, LOL. <laughs> maybe some self-monitoring is happening here. I'm getting sleepier on my old bedtime from 1 a.m. Why is this? I kind of have an idea on what you might reply. LOL, I watched you so much by now, I could hear your voice in my head answering the questions sometimes. Anyway, when I wake up at 7 a.m., I'm really tired and sometimes I want to take a nap. Do you think that is a good thing to do since I'm trying to adjust to my new wake-up time? Like today, I woke up at 7 a.m. and I took a 20, 30-minute nap, kind of conflicted on the nap. Can't wait to hear your thoughts on this. Thanks, Melina. Well, I actually first want to say that uh, I heard this from somebody else. Somebody else said, you know, uh, th this was, what's her name? P Pjorn, Pjorn from, from Thailand, who <laughs> literally went through every single video. It wasn't that many at the time, maybe 150 or something like that, but she went through all of them and she said, I have already, I've, I've started to think like you think, like, you know, so I, 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 I'm not saying anybody needs to binge on this on this channel, but I do think like if you listen for a while and you get to a point where you kind of like almost can anticipate what I'm going to say, then you learn a lot. And I think uh, that could certainly be helpful. But uh, so, so I, I want to say, Melina, I, I think um, uh, I think you've learned a lot when you get to that point where you already already know what I'm saying. So you probably know then what I'm going to say now, which is the following. I think um, if you've uh, if you started, you know, pushing your bedtime two hours earlier, well, then your, uh, you know, the time you, you know, your, your, your circadian rhythm takes a little while to, to adjust, you know, there's a lag time there. So it's completely expected that you wouldn't feel sleepy at, you know, your typical, the typical time when you feel sleepy. Now, if, if, the, if it takes, let's say, you know, as a rule of thumb, they say, you know, when you, um, uh, when you uh, actually let, let's give um, Riley, a, let's see what Riley has to say. Malena, take it from me. Might be the time for sleep detox. You can go so in the weeds and analyze every part of your sleep that you stall in terms of your development. I think oftentimes that is very, very true. That sleep detox can be really, really helpful. But I, but I think actually Malena is doing quite well. And I think she may have actually asked this uh, more for curiosity. But uh, yeah, so it takes a while for that, uh, that kind of circadian rhythm to adjust. The rule of thumb is if you, if you when, when it comes to like traveling across time zones, that if you cross like two time zone, two time zones, it takes like two days to adjust, which is again, a rule of thumb it may take more, may take less. So I, I would just say, uh, I think what you're experiencing is, is very, very um, typical. If you, if anybody randomly wakes up two hours before they typically go to bed, they wouldn't automatically feel sleepy two hours be, you know, two hours earlier that night. So completely expected. I think uh, that you don't need to do anything in particular. I think you should not like, of course, not force yourself to go to bed before you feel sleepy. I think that's number one. I think number two, in terms of that, those naps in the morning, 20 minutes more or less, I don't think matters at all. I really think that um, when, when if, if let's say for, for argument's sake here, say Milena, that it was a week ago that you made this transitioning and you're still feeling sleepy more around when you did in the past, then I think it is a little bit of a, of a break issue here, not a gas issue, it's a break issue. You are probably thinking a lot about the time, you're, you're thinking, you know, you've had a lot of trouble sleeping in the past, so whenever there's kind of change, you're, 
you're, you're tuning into it. You're wondering like, how is this going to change? How is this going to affect me? Will I have more trouble sleeping? You know, you may even think, will I go back to having a lot of trouble sleeping like in the past? Those kind of uh, break issues are probably what's happening. I don't think there's a gas problem. I don't think you need to worry about that extra 20 minutes you you, you sleep in the morning. So I would simply say this, um, get up, you know, around seven, which is kind of your goal. And then uh, and I think allowing yourself about like, you know, giving yourself about eight hours for sleep is great. Remember though that, uh, you know, I know you've been on the channel for quite a while and, and the goal of course is not to have any type of rules or, you know, guidelines or anything uh, once you sleep good you should you're supposed to do like whatever you you know do whatever you want that's the ultimate goal and just get up about the same time every morning because most people do that but then not have any rules or regulations so i think if you're still in that phase where you're like not 100 percent confident when it comes to your sleep then maybe yes give yourself about eight hours in bed you know get up at seven go to bed maybe 10 30 11 or something like that when you feel sleepy and uh and other than that i would say nothing don't change anything don't react to this still try to enjoy bedtime, enjoy the time before bedtime, and uh, and definitely things will fall into place. I'm 100% convinced of that. So Melina, let me know if, if, if what I said was what you expected me to say. Um, we'd, we'd love to hear that. So with that said, let us move forward to our next question. Um, this is from Jervin, uh, and it's actually two emails. Uh, let's read this. The first one came in a few days ago. Why can't I fall asleep? My mind feels like it's on this on the mode and it doesn't change. Even if I'm in bed for hours with my eyes closed, I cannot seem to fall asleep. I'm getting anxiety because of sleeping now. I was also having a bad case of hypnic jerks a couple of days ago and it made me, that made me sleep deprived and made my insomnia worse. Can I ask, can a problem in my thyroid cause, cause this? It all started last week when I suddenly felt weak, lost appetite, and was sweating a lot. And then I think just actually a day or two later, Jerwin came back and said, hi, Daniel, thank you for getting back to me. I think I probably wrote a comment. I was finally able to sleep at 5.30. I woke up after four hours, but I was uh, able to go back to sleep again and almost got seven hours of sleep. I'll put CBTI in practice later today. Hopefully, this will help me in the future. Um, I was really happy to hear that things were already getting better for Jerwin. But let's go back to this um, original question. Uh, first of all, um, the the classic one here is Jerwin was like wondering why can't I fall asleep, and then we read even if I'm in bed for hours with my eyes closed, I cannot seem to fall asleep. Those two things are, uh, you know, in in just those two um, sentences, you you have so much information. You know, uh, as as a lot of people have heard me say like a million times, sleep is a passive process. Sleep only really happens where you're not trying to sleep. That person who sleeps super, super well, sleeps super, super well because they're not exerting any effort, right? So what we hear in Jervin's uh, uh, email is somebody who's lying in bed, eyes closed, just like trying to sleep, which is like, the, the that is all but guaranteed not to lead to any sleep. Because again, the more you try lying there, eyes closed, it's dark, it's cool. You're like, I gotta get some sleep. That's like, uh, that's so much effort. So that does not lend itself to good sleep at all. So that's kind of the first thing I wanted to comment on. Uh, I'm getting anxiety because of sleeping now. That's not unexpected. Of course, if you're not sleeping and you're trying hard and, and it's not coming to you, you'll be expected. I had some hypnic jerks, very, very common with hyper arousal. For anyone that uh, is new to the channel, know that there's a, a playlist on hypnic jerks in the description of every recent video. And they are really like hypnic jerks happen to all of us. They are a normal part of falling asleep, but when you're hyper aroused, they may happen more and you also pay more attention to them. So no, uh, no, no uh, surprises there either. Now the question was here, can a problem in my thyroid cause this? It all started last week when I suddenly felt weak, lost appetite and was sweating a lot. And my, my thinking on this one is, um, uh, there are lots of things that can affect our sleep to some degree. I've definitely had, Patients who had some trouble sleeping, they were found to have, let's say, diabetes or they had a thyroid issue or something like that, and, and they were treated and they slept better. But that is very different from true insomnia, meaning like it takes me hours to fall asleep. I'm thinking about sleep all the time. I can't fall back to sleep. What's going on like that? When you are, when, when that's going on, where you're kind of constantly thinking about sleep, you're worried about your sleep, you, you know, you're really, really struggling with sleep. My understanding, my thinking, my philosophy is that only comes from one place. That only comes from 
um, a place of having developed a fear of wakefulness, you know, a strong desire to sleep, you know, that to me is the song and that, that, that doesn't come from any other place in my philosophy, in my teaching. So Jeremy, I just want to say I'm, I'm super happy that you um, had uh, already seen Better Sleep come your way and the more you learn, uh, the more you um, tune in here, I'm sure you'll sleep better and better. And by the way, then that's kind of the proof too, right? When you're uh, when you're when you're just just by learning educating uh, shifting focus away from sleep if that makes you sleep better well then you have the answer perfect so let us um continue on with question number three um and this is from mouflon hello daniel nice to meet you I am a user at a Mouflon who asked uh, you to contact you under the 46th video in the playlist about fatal familial insomnia and sporadic fatal insomnia. And I'd like to report my case. In these days, I have an awful insomnia. Since the night between the 9th and 10th of August, my sleep reduced and I'm sleeping only a few hours per night. Moreover, I wake up a lot of times during the night and I can sleep well only in the morning. There have been also some nights when I didn't sleep at all, but fortunately that those were only a couple. At the onset of all this 15 days ago, I could sleep two to four hours per night, but now I feel the situation got worse. I honestly don't know how much sleep I'm getting because I don't watch the clock as I used to do before and also because my sleep now is more fragmented. I can't quantify my sleep because I neither uh, uh, don't know if I sleep or just stay in my bed with eyes closed. The only thing I know is that at the end of the night, I begin to have dreams. I'm really worried about having SFI. I know that it's a neurological condition. I don't have problems like ataxia, double vision, etc. But I'm at the beginning of this. Began only 15 days ago, so maybe the symptoms can start after. And I remember that one night I woke up and I had something. I think it was my clonus. It didn't wake me up. I had it when I was already awake. It was an involuntary left thigh contraction that repeated more than one time every two to four seconds. It was similar to a cramp, but it didn't hurt. I hope it wasn't a myoclonus also because I had it also another time when I was awake. I wasn't about to sleep. I was laying on the sofa watching TV. I've also read a lot of case studies uh, of FFI and SFI on the net that started with normal insomnia. I mean, they started with non-sleeping and then they developed other symptoms. So I'm pretty worried. Currently, I'm taking melatonin pills, but they aren't helping. Sorry for my English. Uh, it was very, very fun. <laughs> good. I uh, hope you will reply soon. So Mouflon, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to hear this has been happening, but I'm glad you reached out. And so uh, actually, before I, I forget, I, I have something that um, uh, I, I think the most like um, maybe perhaps the most like important email I've ever gotten since I started this channel came in, I want to say um, Friday, Friday. And I'm going to talk about this tomorrow. So someone named Casper. Uh, from Denmark wrote to me and, and described how his own mom had uh, passed away from SFI and was diagnosed in, uh, during autopsy. And we, we're going to talk about, and I think he's actually going to come and talk to us about this on the channel, which I think is going to bring so much relief to anyone that's ever been worried about this. But, you know, based on his email and my, my communication with Casper so far, what he has told me is that actually the way I've thought about SFI and the way um, Leah, who contributed a lot for a while about this topic, also had understood it, it's, it's completely different from what we call insomnia. Insomnia is when somebody themselves ha have identified that there's a problem with me. I can't sleep. I'm sleeping very little. I have these jerks. I have these tinglings. My balance is off, these type of things. But when somebody has this uh, neurological condition, then they are completely unaware of what's happening. That's what Casper said when he described his own mom. She had no clue that she ever was ill. And, and also what he told me was that, uh, you know, from the outside perspective, it was very obvious that something was very, very wrong uh, in her case. You know, she herself, Casper's mom, she didn't she was completely oblivious to to what was going on she was kind of in another world but um for for the family members there was obviously something was very wrong but what they observed was actually uh, he said 
for a few weeks, she seemed to like two or three weeks, she seemed to sleep less, but most of the time she seemed to sleep much more in fact than she had in the past. So, um, you know, based on what I'm going to share tomorrow, and maybe Casper will come on and talk about this on the channel as well, I think it will be very, very clear what SFI truly is. And, and basically, my, what, I, what I think about this is that anyone who can communicate, like anybody who can put together a, a coherent sentence, anybody who is, you know, knows what year it is and things like that, doesn't have SFI. That's how I think about it. And that's really been confirmed in my mind with this communication with Casper that we'll talk more about tomorrow. So um, uh, going back to this comment here from Muflon, I want to say, um, you know, to anyone, anyone um, that is concerned about your health, you know, talk to your doctor 100%. Now, uh, that said, um, what you, uh, what we hear about here, um, very little sleep for 15 days, uh, maybe just a few hours, and some nights not at all, um, some jerk, some perhaps myoclonus. Um, all we read about here is, I'm not saying this to belittle anything that's going on with you, Muflon, but nothing that we read in this email is, is um, unusual or strange or something that we haven't heard many times on the channel. And what I want to say is very typical is that somebody who is initially worried that they have uh, SFI or FFI, uh, then a couple of weeks later or something like that, uh, uh, often come back to the channel and say, okay, it wasn't that. I realized it was it was really anxiety driven. That's kind of a typical story. So um, I think for, for anyone that has, I say for anyone that has trouble sleeping, uh, I think the key is um, always really to, change your relationship with wakefulness. I think that is, that's becoming my new, like the, the big thing, you know? I think it is helpful to spend a little bit less time in bed uh, or, or not necessarily spend less time in bed, but give yourself less time for sleep. If you, if you go to bed like 10 and you try to sleep and you get out of bed like seven, then you're giving yourself like nine hours for sleep, which often is too much. Like maybe give yourself seven hours, you know? You can still go to bed early and enjoy something but give yourself maybe less time to sleep. I think that's that's good. I think it's also very, very good to try to first actually understand what's going on, you know, browse this channel and figure out like, okay, uh, this is what's happening. This is why I have trouble sleeping. Uh, my and, and try to like uh, listen to other people's stories and try to like identify yourself with what other people say, like, you know, okay, yeah, that fits. Oh, I have the same thing this person had. Okay, got it. Now I understand what's happening. And when, when you get to that point where you're like not worried anymore, you understand that what's happening to you is what's happened to a lot of people, then you're in a place where you can really start befriending wakefulness, like changing your relationship with, with wakefulness at night, being like, okay, I'm awake now. That's okay. I can do this. I can enjoy this show. I can do some drawing. I can formulate a business plan. I can do something meaningful with wakefulness and when your brain sees that okay wakefulness is not a threat it's not a problem it's not a concern it's not an enemy or something like that then it allows you to sleep much much better so those are my big big picture thoughts on Muflon. um thanks for all the comments and all the contributions and any any follow-up questions here like just please let me know yeah uh, bft um is back I slept two nights on the sofa. I was told not to do that because it would make it difficult to sleep in bed. Is that true? <laughs> good, very good question. And, and then when I read this, I'm like, I'm surprised I haven't gotten that one before. Well, here are my thoughts on this. Um, uh, I don't think in any way that sleeping on a sofa in and of itself makes it difficult to then sleep in a bed. Imagine that you are visiting your friends uh, you know that live in a different city and they don't have an extra bed or whatever and you sleep in their couch for two nights and then you go home there's no problem there. there's no particular problem with sleeping elsewhere uh you know uh in and of itself now what can happen though is this what can happen is this that somebody has trouble sleeping and and in that in that um phase of having trouble sleeping your brain is is kind of looking for a solution it goes into like problem solving mode and it's like could it be this? Maybe I'm drinking too much coffee. I'm going to stop that. Maybe I'm having too much spicy food. I'm going to stop that. Maybe, maybe there's a problem where I am. Maybe I'm starting to associate my bed with not sleeping. Maybe I should sleep elsewhere. Or maybe I should sleep on the couch. And when you go on the couch, you kind of feel, you, you kind of like 
remove some pressure to sleep, you know, because the bed is where you're supposed to sleep. So if you're on the couch, you don't feel as pressure to sleep and then you sleep a little better on the couch. You're like, okay, good. I got, I got it. Like I'm sleeping good now on the couch, but then you're like, but I really want to sleep in my bed, but could I do that? I don't know. What if I go back to bed? And then you're like, let me try going to back to my bed again. And then one night you're like, this is it. I'm going to try to sleep in my bed again. Let's see what happens. You go into your bed and you're like, okay, this is it. Hopefully I can sleep in my bed. But wait a minute. It's already been 30 minutes. Mm, no, it's been an hour. Oh my gosh. It's been two hours. No, I can't sleep in my bed. What am I going to do? No, I'm going to go back to the couch. That can often happen. But as you see, as, as I'm trying to, what I'm trying to convey here is that there's nothing inherently different from sleeping on the couch or the bed but it's your thoughts that matter. If you think that there's a problem with your bed, if you if you, uh, if you you pay a lot of attention to what's gonna happen when you go back to your bed, that can cause some rebound insomnia. But other than that, there's no problem there. And for, for people that ask me like, so where should I sleep? Uh, I always say like, you know, sleep where you wanna sleep for the rest of your life, you know, uh, or, you know, indefinitely. If you have no problem sleeping on the couch, if that's like completely, it doesn't matter to you at all. Well, then sleep in the couch or the bed. It doesn't matter. But if you're like, I'm sleeping on my couch, but I would rather sleep in my bed, I think just sleep in your bed, you know, and and, and start doing that. You know, start doing your education, maybe the habit change, your learning and, and all that while you're sleeping in your bed. You know, you might have a couple of nights where you sleep less just because you're kind of like self-monitoring a lot, but eventually you'll sleep well in your bed and then what will happen is that you don't have this transition where you're like okay now i'm sleeping on my couch but eventually i have to go sleep in my bed and that kind of looming thing uh, hanging over you so bft hope that made sense and thanks for being live with us here so we talked about the move flown and let's go over to this question from dawa so dawa um a sense uh, a question that we talked about with coach Michael uh, Friday and this is a follow up here uh, that was says thank you very much for the reply anytime thank you for submitting a question I will try the tips any more good healthy tips will be very helpful what do you think about trying chamomile tea and melatonin supplements smiley smiley still hasn't taken the prescription medication I want to learn more about my insomnia more elaborate diagnosis about me is OCD and depression now I am trying to stay positive I haven't given up yet uh, to become the same healthy man as before. I'm very happy to hear that. I think there is nothing standing in your way of becoming the same healthy man as before. The only thing I think you need is, is just education, really. Understanding sleep, understanding OCD, understanding depression. And speaking of that, you know, I, the way I think of it, you know, I think all these things that, we, we, that I, I like to call like mental wellness um, things, uh, are really tied together by, at, at the core, you know? For example, when it comes to insomnia, uh, what's, what happens is that you, you don't sleep well for a random reason, and then you start uh, having this kind of fear of sleeplessness, you're worried about your sleep, and then you're trying to escape that, you know? You're like trying to do things to make yourself sleep. You're trying to escape the fear of sleeplessness, you know? Uh, and, 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 and the more you try to escape it, the more trouble you have, you know. I think it's the same with other things too. Like if you have a lot of racing thoughts and you're like, how can I stop the racing thoughts? How can I quiet my brain? I, I you know, you, you, you don't want to listen to your brain. Then it shouts louder. The more you try to escape racing thoughts, the more racing thoughts you have. Or uh, sadness, you know, you start feeling sad for a reason and then you're like kind of judging that. Like, well, why am I feeling sad? There's something wrong with me. I don't want to feel this sad. What should I do to feel less sad? You try to escape the sadness, the more of it you have. I think that ties all of these things together. So I think when you learn about insomnia, what you learn about that, you can really apply to everything else. So I think um, what you learn on this channel, I hope you can uh, use for, for anything else in that, in that realm. So, and that actually uh, uh, segues well into this question, what do you think about trying chamomile tea and melatonin supplements? So let's real quick go into this kind of threat monitoring uh, model, which I think is super helpful. Um, Imagine our brain, right? A brain is there for a specific purpose. It is to keep our, our species alive, you know? Um, all the emotions that we have, you know, happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, anger, and uh, fear, they're all there for a specific practical reason to keep us safe, you know? Fear is there to make sure we run away or hide uh, if something's coming away. Danger, uh, anger, I mean, is to, to make sure we kind of protect ourselves. Happiness is there to make sure we do things 
productively, like, uh, uh, you know, eat and hunt for berries and whatever it is. Now, uh, when, when there is a real threat out there, like you're being attacked by a tiger, uh, you know, uh, our, our brains work perfectly well. They're like, okay, fear, uh, like scared away or hide, perfect. It's, it's, it's designed, our brains are designed for those tangible physical prob uh, threats. Now, what can happen though, is that our brain can get a little bit confused. It can start looking at sleeplessness, which is another word for being awake at night as a threat. It can go like, oh my gosh, you're awake at night. This is a threat, it's a problem, it's a tiger, it's coming at you, what are you gonna do? And then you try to escape, right? But you cannot escape a perceived threat. You can't escape sleeplessness. You can't escape wakefulness, right? So when you try to like, make yourself sleep, you try to protect your sleep, you try to do those things, you know, it doesn't work. In, in fact, you have more trouble sleeping and it seems like, oh my God, this was a bigger threat. Then you try more to escape it. You have more trouble. You try more to escape. You have more trouble, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have insomnia. So when you ask here, like, how about chamomile tea? How about melatonin? I'm thinking these are acts of escapism. You're, you're trying to do things so you keep yourself safe from the threat of sleeplessness. Now, what can happen when you do those things are one of two in my, in my mind. You either end up on the path of frustration or the path of confusion. You know, if you try some chamomile tea or sleepy time tea or melatonin or like CBD or THC or whatever it is, and you're not sleeping anymore or better, then you get frustrated. Nothing works. Oh my gosh, something's really wrong with you. You get more frustrated and you sleep worse, right? Then if you take some chamomile tea and you somehow, because you believe in it, sleep better, then that might sound like that's good, but I think that's even worse because what's happened then is your confidence has been externalized. You, you, you start thinking, yeah, there's definitely something wrong with me. Now I need to drink chamomile tea to sleep a little bit. And guess what? Two weeks later or a week later, when the chamomile tea doesn't make you sleep anymore, it's like, oh my gosh, that stopped working. And now you're on the path of confusing and that's, uh, that's not helpful at all either. So. I think uh, never, never good to do things, ingest things uh, to make yourself sleep. Uh, that's that's definitely my thinking on that one, and um, and I think uh, yeah, I think that pretty much uh, answered this question. That I think hang in there, you know, stay here, learn, and I think you'll do really, really well. Okay, let's see what um, Michael says. Michael Green, who I know very well, actually uh, said I slept on the couch for years. The only problem. Uh, I found is having, I slept on a couch for years. I found having a dedicated room more conducive for sleep. You know, good point. Maybe the couch wasn't comfortable. Maybe um, for another reason, uh, Michael didn't sleep that well. Maybe that applies to you too, BFT. Maybe you're not sleeping that well on the couch. That's another reason maybe having another dedicated room uh, is better, you know. Um, so th thanks so much for chiming in, Mike. Um, and then, yeah, let's continue here. Next question is from Leila. It's a little bit longer one, very important one though. Let, let's read this. Um, first of all, Leila says, thanks so very much for all your hard work helping people with their sleep anytime. I really enjoy it. Your videos are so informative, honest, and reassuring. That's why I'm contacting you as I need reassurance on a subject that has been causing me some issues. Not only you, uh, Leila, many, many, many people have had the same concerns that you have. I started having some insomnia when lockdown began in April due to the coronavirus pandemic. I was a wreck for a while, but my dear old brain never let me go more than three consecutive days with less than four hours sleep, and I've been improving with each passing month. Glad to hear. But I'd seen the headlines about how bad sleep is and how it's so dangerous for you. I decided to Google the details. Big mistake. Remember, um, everyone, um, Brian, who was a guest on Talking Insomnia Guest, I believe two weeks ago. That was like his number one thing. Don't Google it. Anyway, it happens. Don't be hard on yourself, Lilo. I came across a recurring theme of the brain cleaning itself only during deep sleep, getting rid of toxins that cause Alzheimer's if they're not cleared by sleeping. I did so much research, even reading the studies themselves, which was mind numbing. That's how my insomnia began. I will admit, even though I'm a 45 year old woman, I would sit unable to sleep and crying my eyes out, imagining that my poor brain was filling up with toxins every time I missed sleep or had less sleep. 
Sleep was something I just always did. And if I had my monthly cycle, a couple of days or a bad night here and there, I wasn't worried as I knew I'd be back on track in a day or two. I've only had four days in my entire adult life where I've had no sleep, so I'm very lucky. But after this, I'm still experiencing fear, anxiety, or this issue of cleaning. It'll creep back when my sleep isn't so great or will stop me having good sleep because it will just pop up again in my daft brain. Use the word daft. It just goes to prove I'm British, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> True. Uh, what I would like to ask you is this. Am I a fool, naive, for not being convinced by this theory? As I said, I've done so much research and I just don't trust it. Most of the tests are on mice which can be misleading, not to mention insanely cruel. Stopping a mouse sleeping for two months, yeah, I agree with that. Every test uses EG and fMRI, which I'm aware could be tweaked to achieve the desired results. The most recent is a scan showing the brain cleaning itself that was featured in all the science journals and in the media. They're still using the 90 minute sleep stage system, which as I understand has been discredited by sleep specialists, that, but not neurologists. The neurologists who first discovered this, uh, a Dr. Niedergaard, call it the glymphatic system and has been going on about it for years. She seems obsessed with it, even admitting that she has a sleep routine which drives her family nuts in one of her interviews. She sounds like the kind of scientist you mentioned in one of your videos. They have egos, need funding and attention. Some neurologists have questioned the system, but she has dismissed criticism by claiming they have recorded incorrect measurements. Apparently, cerebrospinal fluid cleans the brain during the day anyway. Osteopathy knows about this, maybe more during sleep. So I just don't see the need to keep drumming this at people to continue to get more deep sleep where you're going to get Alzheimer's. Doesn't deep sleep lessen as we age naturally? If it's vital to have so much deep sleep to clean the brain, then wouldn't losing it as we get older be a bit of an evolutionary screw up? <laughs> Is deep sleep another piece of neurological hype? And there's been a lot of it last decade. If sleep doesn't cause any major health problems, then how can any of this be true, especially as too much sleep has been associated with dementia, even more than less sleep. So what happens there? If the cleaning is true in its most extreme form, then why aren't there more people with dementia? As insomnia, trouble with sleep is so very common. Uh, parents to newborns, for example, you can see why I'm so confused. Mainstream academia, public and public science don't seem to question anything anymore, but just accept everything at face value, which is worrying. I have included links to this above. I hope they work. The NH article is very strange as it follows the link to the actual studies and they say very different things to what is being alluded to in the main article. The NHS article seems to be the most sensible article and quite reassuring. There's no much, there's so much conflict in data out there. Sorry, I'm rambling, but I really need to closure on this and to simply never think about it again. This includes sleep when I never studied it or thought about it, I had no problems, no brain really, which is tough when I haven't spoken to sleep specialists about it. I know the subject isn't that important, I think it's very important actually. And I know my insomnia has been caused by hyperarousal. Thanks for the info. So that's a lot of my mind. It's been a tough time uh, over the past four months. My father-in-law passed away, not COVID related. My husband has six elective seizures. My dear dad has been diagnosed with cancer, low grade, thank God. And I've had 12 asthma attacks. So the last thing I need is for this to keep niggling at me. Um, I'm so tired of the back and forth. Is my brain damaged? Is it all nonsense? If I lose more sleep, will my brain just keep filling up with toxins? Oh, enough already. I'm ready for this to stop. Anyway, thanks so much for reading my extremely lengthy email. And I hope I haven't taken up too much of your valuable time. Thank you again for your good work. I hope the likes of Martin Reed and Michael Schwartz, you will one day be the main voices heard, valued and respected in the world of sleep. You're the ones who actually care about people and their problems rather than seeing them as lab rats or statistics. Well done. Your work is so appreciated. Uh, listen, uh, Leila, this was uh, a really, really important um, email. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, that part where you said, am I naive for not believing this? I say the complete opposite. You are lucid. You completely understand the whole thing. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm inclined to say, yes, it's all nonsense. I, be I don't believe this in any way, shape or form. Meaning is, is the cerebrospinal fluid part of like, you know, moving certain proteins from the from this space to that space, probably uh, that that may very well be true. But uh, does it happen per, per, uh, predominantly in deep sleep? And is it important to have deep sleep? I don't think so at all. And for the for many of the reasons you mentioned, for men, we start losing our deep deep sleep early, and we have very little of it left when we're older. So if that's so important, then why would we just like lose deep sleep? Doesn't make any sense. And also. Um, speaking of studies, 
there is no uh, evidence that people who have insomnia have any different longevity from people who don't. There was a huge study that included 37 million people uh, that, that you know published uh, early last year that showed this. And uh, basically, everything you write in this email that you know makes you see skeptic, I agree with all that. I don't think there's any any truth to this whatsoever. And I want to, uh, if you haven't seen it, let me just read my little book here, Why We Don't Sleep, how the wellness industry unintentionally created an insomnia epidemic and how academia, media, the medical community, non-for-profits, and a large governmental body keep feeding it. It is, it is very problematic what's happening in the world, which is that there is this constant fight for eyeballs, right? Media wants eyeballs because they need to sell ads. Uh, uh, people in academia needs eyeballs because they need funding. Uh, um, uh, governmental bodies like non-for-profits, they need to stay relevant. They need to come up with guidelines and things like that. And you know, the message of like sleep is sleep is important because if you if you're not sleeping well, you feel tired. You know, that doesn't get any eyeballs. Doesn't get anybody's attention. So they're constantly trying to, you know. Um, play things up and it's really sad when you, you you go to the original article and you see there's nothing there and then you you see how it's portrayed in the media and even on like uh national like uh governmental uh, agencies home pages it is really sad and i think it's 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 terrible really how there's this disregard for people how people feel the anxiety these things produce um but yeah, I think I think this will not live on for that long. I think it, it reminds me a lot of what was going on when I was a fellow, maybe nine, ten years ago now. Back then, there was a lot of talk about how if you sleep deprive somebody, then you 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 could see that their kind of uh, ghrelin and leptin levels were, were kind of um, thrown off, and they had like not as good sugar control. And people are saying, "Oh, we got it." It's like when people sleep less, they have sleep apnea, and they have trouble sleeping, and something like that that causes like diabetes, but that whole thing just was never, it never went from the, you know, that could never been be proven in big studies. I think the same thing with this is that if you take a, a couple of mice, you do this to them, you check their brains and then you're like, oh yeah, this can cause this and that. It doesn't mean anything in my mind. So <laughs> Leila, I, I hope this like mini rant was helpful to you. And uh, I think you have absolutely zero to worry about. Your brain is in a, in a great shape. You know, as you stop, as, as you stop worrying about this and you sleep better, you know, you, you feel even better, you know, but uh, that's it. Um, let's see. Uh, Radeep, I'm doing really well. Thanks for chiming in. Uh, <clears throat> Michael says, I agree with Layla. Uh, Daniel, you've helped so many. Oh, that's super nice. You probably a safe space for those who want to understand sleep and framework. Appreciate it, Michael. I need, uh, super happy to hear this. Um, Riley, I also appreciate Dallas ashtray smoking analogy. For those of us with anxiety about sleep, it's important to remember that in sleep health, correlation doesn't equal causation. Hundred percent, you know, like uh, nobody's, you know, ashtrays are very linked to lung cancer, COPD. But there's never been anybody that shows that uh, ashtrays cause those issues at all. In fact, as I also like to point out, if you have a lot of trouble with your health in general, do you expect that that person will sleep well? Not really. So there's no, if there's a link between poor sleep and, and health problems, who's surprised, right? That doesn't show, mean that uh, one causes, uh, well, that, that short sleep causes health problems at all. All right, um, that, that is, as you can tell, that's one of my fav favorite ranting topics. <laughs> so Leila, thank you for an opportunity to, to rant a little bit there. And looks like we actually have time for this last one, right? Yeah, coming from Kevin Lewis. Who might be sending me an email because he asked for my for an email address. But let's just read this one. Um, it started six years ago when I watched my mother pass away in her sleep. Something changed in me that day. I stopped sleeping completely. My mind related death and sleep as a trigger. Since then, I've been in hell ever since I have experienced things that no one should go through. My survival mode kicked in and has taken over my life. I don't live anymore. I survive. I long for a day when things could turn around, but it's it has not yet. How do I retrain my brain to relax? I need to cling on to the hope that someday someone will put me on the right path to achieve this. It hasn't happened yet. You know, when I read that, uh, Kevin, I, I, you know, first thing that comes to mind is, of course, I'm super sorry this happened. And uh, also, there's no mystery, of course, to why you have trouble sleeping. If you witness something like that and you, and you see somebody pass away in their sleep, then, of course, that 
can trigger a lot of anxiety around sleep. No question about that. Now, the question then becomes, of course, okay, so how can I get towards a place where, um, where I'm sleeping better? And I think, you know, uh, no matter what the tr original trigger is, uh, th at some point, uh, the, the the trigger becomes you know sleep itself or insomnia itself that initially it was it was the trigger of witnessing this and at some point it became like but now I'm afraid of sleeping I'm afraid of everything that regards to sleep etc so uh, I think learning about insomnia like I, I think for everyone is really really good understanding where it comes from I think um, going to a place where I talked about before, like trying to befriend wakefulness, even when it happens at night, instead of like perhaps, you know, being up at night, like trying to go to bed, trying to quiet your mind, trying to, to, to quiet those racing thoughts, go to a place of like, okay, I'm going to listen to these thoughts that I have. I'm going to write them down. I'm going to show my brain that I'm not trying to resist them because the more you resist certain thoughts, you know, racing thoughts, et cetera, the, the more powerful they get. Right. So journaling, writing down, like taking five minutes every day, day to, write down your thoughts if those thoughts pop up at night maybe write them down listen to them don't try to resist them and when you feel you're in a place where you can do this then go towards like you know i'm gonna instead of like trying to sleep at night i'm gonna try to pick up a nice book listen to a podcast you know doing something that is enjoyable in and of itself and show the brain that uh wakefulness at night sleeplessness it really isn't a threat you know one can one can pass away in one's sleep but it isn't from not sleeping, you know, and being awake at night is, is a lot, it happens to a lot of us and it's not in itself, uh, you know, a threat or an enemy or anything like that. So, uh, you know, let me know uh, what other questions and thoughts you have. And I hope you'll find some information on this channel that will, that will set you on the path towards sleeping really well. So with that said, um, I want to thank everybody that sent questions, everybody chimed in and um, I will be back here tomorrow with this really important email from Casper. So and until then, uh, take it easy, everyone, and I'll uh, uh, look forward to having you back real soon.